Well, good morning. How's everybody doing today? My name's Tom. I'm a pastor here at the church. Today is part two of the series. Hallelujah. Please tell me why, but it's a big day in the life of our church. I'm just going to acknowledge this right up front. You know, today we open our second campus, Oak Ridge City, in the... I guess you could technically say it's our third since we have a church down in Haiti, but uh, this is one we can visit here. So I, before we get started into the service, I want to give you guys a moment just to pray for them and what God's going to do. I mean, it's just one church, two locations, so there's a lot going on there. They're trying to figure out how the building works, where people park, and to do all these things. So they've got a lot going on right now, and with all that said, there's so many new people that uh, are going to be seeing really the Jesus that we see for the first time ever through there. So if I could give you a moment just to, just to pray for them. Father, we just have two words, really just two words. Just thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Who loves the Christmas season? All right. So we decided since this is really kind of, I guess we kicked off Christmas last week kind of here, but this is kind of that we just kind of tone it down, be a little bit reflective, to start off the service. We kind of like to do that here at Oak Bridge. So if you want to stand and you can join in as we sing. Wait, sorry. I'm going to turn my guitar on this time. <laughs> oh, that's embarrassing. All right. Boom. All right. Let's, let's take two. <laughs> Before you sit down, look at somebody next to you and either say, I hate Rudolph or I love Rudolph. There you go. You can go ahead and take your seats. And a bit more traditional Christmas. Look at, turn your eyes towards the screen. And this is really what we 
Heart of Christmas. Watch the video. Christmas presents are exciting. Do you remember what you'd say is the best gift you've ever received at Christmas? I asked my kids this question, and here's what they said. My six-year-old loved her little talkie doll that could talk, blink, and not much else. It cost a whopping $110 after tax, and it lasted for a solid eight months before it found its way to the back of her closet. My nine-year-old said his favorite was the popular fantasy book series, six books in all, each getting progressively longer. The set cost $58 and lasted eight weeks before it lived its final dust-filled existence on a shelf. Now my tween loved the Brainy Putty collection that cost $32 and lasted a measly eight days before it went to live in our carpet. Finally, my teenage son wanted the ultimate drone with a 4K camera. It cost the most and lasted the shortest amount of time. I'd like to say it lasted eight minutes, but no, it was eight seconds, which is only impressive in bull riding. As exciting as those gifts are, what if there was a gift at Christmas that was far better? In fact, so much better that it makes these look like, well, toys. What if this gift was worth so much that no one could buy it for you, nor could you afford it? What if it was something of extreme value, like, say, life itself? And what if this gift was given through the birth of a baby who became our paid in full. That's the gift offered to all. It costs us nothing, him everything. It lasts just a bit longer than eight seconds, eight days, eight weeks, or even eight months. It lasts forever. Yeah, wow. I got somebody new up here. We have a new hostess to help us with all the announcements and so forth. This is Laura. Give a round of applause. Tell us a little about yourself, Laura. Um, so my name is Laura Campbell. I've been coming to Oak Ridge for about seven years now. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve as a greeter. Um, I've served in Detour and also our varsity um, program that we do during the summer. I'm also a fourth grade teacher, and I'm a group fitness instructor at Club Fitness. That's great. You know, I told you guys earlier, she, she's a fitness instructor at Club Fitness. If you show up there, she'll give you 90% off a membership. <laughs> no, that ain't going to happen. I'm just kidding you with that. You're also uh, a, a new mom, right? Yes. How, yes. how old's your baby? Um, she just turned 15 weeks a couple days ago. Now so. look at this. 15 weeks and look at her. You ladies can hate her right now if you choose to. I mean, you're more than welcome to. I'm so glad to have Laura here. She is a phenomenal uh, person. Uh, her husband, Tyson, helps a lot. He's a great guy. He's the wrestling coach at Fox. Is that right? Head wrestling yep. coach there? Yep. And uh, just great. So what, what announcement you got for us? Um, so if you are a guest here today, we are so excited that you're here. We've got an awesome service for you. Um, after service, if you could go out to our information center, we have a new guest brochure. And inside, you'll find out a little information about our church. And also, there will be two free coupons, one for a free drink from our cafe, and then also a free T-shirt for you and everyone in your family who's here. So make sure you pick that up. Um, also, if you're a guest, you'll notice that we don't take an offering in this service. We want you to sit back, relax, and let this service be our gift to you. But if you do call Oak Bridge your home, um, there are joy boxes around the campus as well as online giving and text giving. And we ask that you just freely give as God has called you to. And lastly, you'll notice that we don't take communion in this service. However, right behind me is a room called the Reflection Room. And after service, you can go back there and do that. Yeah, she nailed it, huh? Is that right there? I want to tell you about Christmas next week. Look, it's the time to invite, all right? We have services at 9-11. I've already seen the music. I know what it's going to be about. It is going to be an off-the-chart service. You're going to love it. God's going to touch our hearts. And then we have one at 4 o'clock that's different than the 9 and the 11. So uh, it's kind of like a Christmas Eve Eve service. A little toned down. Is that right, Nick? Kind of got it toned down a little bit. But it's going to be great. So you can make both of them. Here's my advice to you. Whoever you invite, whichever one they want to go to, that's the one I'd go to. If they want to go to both, go to both. But you're going to love it. It's just a great way to kick off the couple days before Christmas. So we've got a lot... A lot planned, and it's just going to be a good time. So 9 and 11, regular services, they're going to be full. And then 4 o'clock, Christmas Eve Eve kind of service, it's going to be great as well. And uh, with that said, I'm going to tell you guys we have this little Be Rich campaign, right? I can give you the number. We are $1,000 short 
of $40,000. Our goal is $30,000. So, uh, we're actually $9,000 over the goal. So, that's beautiful. We have $1,000 short of uh, $40,000. Wouldn't it be great if Laura, as a new host, made up that $1,000? I mean, you'd have this job forever if you do that. If for those of you that still want to give to the B-Rich, then please do so. Uh, remember, we, giving is a we thing. Uh, generosity is a we thing. And we're going to help so many people. You're going to hear over the next few weeks about all the organizations that we're going to help. One called me already and said, look, if you guys give by this certain time period, are you going to be able to help us this week? And I said, I'll know by this Sunday. And I said, we have a person that's willing to double whatever you guys give. All right, so, you know, you're changing your community. We're changing our hearts. We're changing our families and our children. You make differences all over the place. So I am just so proud, proud to be part of this congregation that serves our community and our area so well. So on behalf of all you guys, give yourselves a round of applause. Just thank you. Any of you guys, quick question, you got to jump in with me. Any of you guys hate it when families get together and they make you take a family photo? For like Christmas, raise your hand where I can see it. I mean, just get it up high because I'm proud. This is me too. I, how, many, how many of you guys it doesn't bug? You, family photos are good. All right. Uh, Laura, how about you? Uh, it depends. Well, be a little bit more decisive. <laughs> you like them or don't? Um, well, I like it, but now we have three kids in our family under the age of two, so it makes it really hard to get everybody looking really jingling keys. Okay, and, you know, it is a tough right thing. That's exactly right. I'm going to tell you what every family photo shoot is like, but I'm going to tell you by showing you a video. So turn your eyes towards this video and see if this doesn't remind you of some of the things you've heard or said. Here you go. The theme this year is going to be rustic denim in front of a barn. Do we live in the suburbs? Yes. Have we ever been to a barn? No. But I thought it would make perfect sense for a Christmas photo. That's what you're going to wear? I didn't spend $40,000 on a liberal arts education for you to shop at Goodwill. Tuck your shirt in. Put your hand up. Is that seriously his haircut? No, Catherine, your boyfriend can't be in the photo. Y'all been dating two weeks. Does he not even own a belt? Why does your elbow go like that? Can we get a scarf for him or something? Cover up that disgusting tattoo. Move your leg in. Move your hand down. Christopher Allen, do you even want to be in this family? This photo is going to your principal. No, Josiah, you can't bring a guitar out here. Mr. A and G chord can't even make the church worship band. You calling that a necklace these days, Chelsea? Looks like you just took the leash off the dog. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Dylan, a tennis racket? Why don't you play a real sport like football roll tag? Sit down. Stand up. Act like you love each other. Me and your mother are respected in this community. She's going through that all-natural, no-makeup stage again. Can we at least put her in the back? Lean forward. Shoulders turn. I know he's living in Portland, but does he even wash his hair now? Can Vanessa at least cover up her stomach or something? This is going to the church. Move your knee in. Are we missing somebody? Wake her up. She's in the car. I know you can't feed the horses. Now get together and act like you love each other. Why don't you guys stand?
Father God, we just thank you that you are here. And we thank you that we are in your presence, worshiping together this morning as a church family. God, as we celebrate this time of year, you came to earth. Father, we just want to remember that you came so that we can be free. We thank you for that. Lord, I just pray that we would welcome your presence in our hearts as your message is delivered through Tom this morning. Please be with us, bless us, speak to us, help us to learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a seat, if you will. Part two of Hallelujah, please tell me why. So if you're joining us right now, you can go to OakbridgeCC. Dot com online and catch last week's message, but I need you to repeat after me. I need you to participate a little bit today uh, along with me, but uh, so repeat after me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joyful praise of God. One more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The joyful praise of God. That's what the definition of hallelujah is. It's the joyful praise of God. It's just not praising God like, okay, God, I, I know this is going on. I'm going to praise you through it. It's the joyful. You're, you're glad. There's something deep down inside. You're glad to praise God. This is what we're trying to bring uh, during this season to people's lives. I think that's what God wants is this joyful praise of God. And I think it can change us. I mean, all different uh, ages, whether you're young or old, having joyful praise is totally different. Uh, waking up and being able to have joyful praise is totally different than just praise. I mean, it's something that's got a little bit more power to it, a little bit more uh, excitement to it. And it's kind of like the word, yeah. Remember how we talked about that last week? It's kind of like saying, yeah, an example. Uh, if you go to get gas and you see one gas has raised up 25 cents and the next five stations have all raised their price uh, 25 cents, then you find that sixth station and they haven't raised their price yet. What do you say? Yeah. Okay, a little bit more. What do you say? Yeah, right? But we're going to say hallelujah. You, you saw the sixth station, they were 25% less. What do you say now? Hallelujah. A little bit more gusto. All right, I'm going to ask you guys to become a little bit more charismatic and Pentecostal today, all right? Now, if you're not a believer at all, that's great. Charismatic, charismatic and Pentecostals are a little bit more over the top. That's what I'll say. But that's okay. I like it. I love it at times, all right? So today we can go that way. So I don't want you to be Baptist. That's what I want you to be today, okay, where you're just sitting there and kind of, so we ready to go? We all good on this? All right. So I had a family get-together uh, this weekend. My son, Matt, flew in from Atlanta with my daughter, Ian, and, and uh, our new little uh, granddaughter, Willow. And it was great. And we, we had our Christmas a little bit early. We had it uh, yesterday. And uh, Kathy was waiting for one key gift for Ann. She'd ordered a necklace like three weeks earlier. That was her key gift. And it hadn't made it in. Yesterday, about one hour before I picked them up, it came in from Amazon. She got the gift. And what do you think Kathy said? Hallelujah. Exactly right. Hallelujah. It came in. Unbelievable. She was glad about that. So I want to show you some family pictures. Cut me some slack here right now. This has absolutely nothing to do with the message. It's just that I am a grandpa right now, right? And I'm the senior pastor, so I'm going to do it. Here you go. Show, show you a first picture. Yeah, that, oh, that's a good one. See, see little Willow up there with Ann, the little red headband on and Little baby Lola and all that. Show the next picture. Oh, not my four grandkids. Isn't that phenomenal, huh? Love it. Show the next one. Yeah, Tripp's going to be a goalie. He wore those. I, we got him those goalie pads for the morning, and he wore them for uh, 15 straight hours. Now, true <laughs> statement. I'm a true statement, right? Next one, there you go, in their robes. That's it. Thank you, guys. Yeah. But I really tell you, you know why I see those pictures? Because, see, I see those pictures, you know what I say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful for family. I'm so thankful that my family could gather together at this, this time of the year. Hallelujah. That's what I say. Say it with me one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's exactly right. The joyful praise of God. Last week, we talked about how this kind of plays out a little bit. How the joyful praise of God, not just praise God like, oh, God, I know you're going to get me through this, but the joyful praise of God. And we talked about that God enters our messes. In other words, you mess up your life. You have some messy action. God doesn't run from it. Imagine that you have paint, and you have carpeting, and you have wood floor, and all of a sudden, the paint can tips off of the ladder, and it just goes everywhere. You know it's everywhere. And you just, what do you want to do in that kind of mess? You just want to walk away from it. You want to say, that's somebody else's responsibility. Some of you have sold your house because of it, right? And it's just such a mess. God doesn't do that. When our uh, paint spills in our life, 
God doesn't run away from it. In fact, when you turn towards him, he runs towards you. Most of my friends, if, if they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus, it's because they think that Jesus is there just to condemn them. And that could be no, nothing further than the truth. He's there to help them with their mess. And we all have messes, that's for sure. So last week, we made the statement, God enters our messes. Pentecostal, hallelujahs, anybody? All right, all right. Let's try this one again. Last week, we understood the deep truth that God doesn't run from our messes. He enters our messes. Hallelujah. There you go. You got it. That's where we're going. All right. That brings more joy in our life. So we're in the second hallelujah. We've got three. We're going to go through a big one next week, but the second hallelujah. And all these I don't think we normally think about. I don't think they're normal to you. I don't think you get that. But uh, again, back, back to last week, when you have a mess, it's good to know, God, you're coming. I'm turning towards you. That is a total hallelujah. And that is joyful knowing he doesn't condemn me. He doesn't kick me out from my past, the stupidity of what I did or what somebody did to me. He says, look, I came for the messes. I came for the messy people. And as far as I know, that's everybody. Everybody has a mess to their life. So this week, the second hallelujah, the joyful praise of God. Before I get there, I want us to read something together. Put this up on the screen. and Let's read this with your outside voice together. Ready? Wait for the tech. Here we go. Ready? All together. Anxiety comes when we look at our circumstances and then look at our ability. But mercy comes when we look at our circumstances and then at God's ability. One more time. Ready? Anxiety comes when we look at our circumstances and then look at our ability. But mercy comes when we look at our circumstances and then at God's ability. Mercy, the key word there is, it's the compassionate treatment of those in distress or need. That's what mercy is the compassionate treatment of those in distress or need. Mercy is also a byproduct of mercy is the person can't help themselves. You can only help them. You can only give them mercy. Remember when you used to get your little brother in a, in a headlock and you used to give them noogies on their head? I don't know if you guys did that. All right? I always did that to her. That's why some of that explains a lot. But, and, so, and, and, and I'd make him say give, give. That's just another word of saying what? Mercy, mercy. Mercy, in the M MMA right now, they tap out. They're saying what? Are you going to break my arm? Are you going to choke me out? Mercy, mercy. That's what this mercy is. Mercy, it's where you have the power to help somebody and you do so. Out of compassion. That's huge. So see, when we, when we look at our circumstances, we get anxiety because we realize we have limited ability. But when we look at our circumstances with the idea that God shows mercy, it changes a lot of that. It changes a lot of that. So I wanted to kind of help you with this. Mercy idea a little bit more. It's the compassionate treatment of those uh, in distress or need. This weekend, I showed you there were two babies here this weekend at my house. One of them was seven weeks old, and the other one was six and a half months old. And there's three things that you learn. I've been around babies for a while to that degree that much. They stayed at the house for a couple days. There's three things you learn about babies. There's three things they do. They eat, they sleep, and they, they poop. That's exactly right. Uh, Christianize it. And they go too. All right, anyway. That, so they eat, they sleep, and they poop. That's what babies do. So um, if you didn't give a mercy, this is kind of harsh, if you didn't give a baby mercy, they wouldn't live. I mean, if you don't feed them, those babies, they cry for a reason. If you keep the, the diaper on them or you don't let them sleep or help them sleep, you know, mercy is huge to being able to live. And so this past weekend, um, my son-in-law and my daughter, Katie, they spent the night at the house and with all the kids. And, and uh, baby Lola, the little seven-month-old, uh, was crying. And she's normally crying for one of three reasons. They are what? Eat, sleep, or poop. Katie looks at uh, her husband, Jeremy, and she says, she's fed. She's not hungry. She just woke up from a nap. I think she needs changed. Now, the look on Jeremy's face, my son-in-law, was one of no mercy. Right? <laughs> he, he didn't want any mercy. He says, look, I don't... I don't really want to change uh, baby Lola. The look on my, daughter, my daughter's face was one of, you'd better change baby Lola, that kind of a deal. Now, it was a bit tense. They were sleeping in the same, you'd have to understand the sleeping situations. It was tight at my house. But uh, so he gets down and he uh, takes off the diaper and he goes, oh, it's a fresh one. And uh, he starts to change baby Lola, gets right, right, right there and he says, I, I can't do this. I just can't do this right now. Now, for a lot of you women right now, you, I know what you're thinking. You'd better do it. Well, my daughter actually rescued him. 
And so you know what I thought? Jeremy, no mercy at all. That you had no mercy. You've got to be it for this message. So you guys understand the idea of mercy? You've got to help somebody. They can't help themselves. So that's one. Here's, here's another example of, of that. You guys ever, who's ever been pulled over by a policeman? Raise your hand. Get your hands up high. We can see all you, you, you Christians that are lawbreakers and so forth, right? All on the same page. What's the first thing you think when you're pulled over by a cop? Will he show me mercy? Here's what you do. I didn't know I was going that fast. I thought the sign said pause, not stop, right? You start thinking. You're thinking the whole time. You make this look on your face. You're as polite as you can be. He says, can I see your driver's license? Or she says, can I see your driver's license? Goes back in. The whole time you're thinking, oh, show me mercy. Show me mercy. I can't. Otherwise, you don't show me mercy. It's going to cost me. I can't get out of this on my own. You show me mercy. Isn't that right? Everybody say the same thing? That's what we do. Well, it's their choice whether they show, show mercy or not. Whether they help people in their distress, distress, whether they show compassion to people that are like that. Any of you guys ever gotten out of a ticket when you've been pulled over? Raise your hand. Yeah. I pull the pastor card out every single time. <laughs> anyway, here's, here's the reality of it. Uh, some of you, and God says this, have a mercy gift. In other words, you are merciful. You show mercy. In other words, like this. You drive along the road, and you see a deer that's been hit by a car. You know what you think? Oh, poor deer. I wonder if it had any baby deers. You know what I think? Dented somebody's bumper. What a bummer. That's what I think. I don't have the mercy gift. I don't have it. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you just can't stand to see somebody hurting? You uh, want to volunteer for stuff all the time to help people? You go to, how many of you have that gift? Raise your hand. Yeah, most of you do. All right? Or in other words, you know that God's equipped you to show mercy. And you just want to help with people that are in distress or in need. You, that's just who you are. You help family. How many of you, like when God gave this gift, you were maybe out somewhere doing something. You don't have the gift of mercy at all. Raise your hand. Okay. Look, stand here, hand up. We got we to gotta unite. We got to help each other, all right? I don't have the mercy gift at all. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of it. I'm not saying this is a good way. I'm saying it to be honest to show you the power of the mercy gift. And if you don't have it, what happens? But uh, for me, uh, I, I do acts of mercy, but I got to think about it. I got to be pushed to do it. It just doesn't come natural. So I've been on quite a few mission trips. In fact, I went one with Compassion International, and I've gone down to Haiti quite a few times. So I'll give you a picture. We bring a lot of students down to Haiti, and uh, we've gone down there a lot of times as a church on medical mission trips, and we actually do, you do, a great work in that community. But when I go down there, there's always a bunch of little kids that come that we go meet with and play with and talk to and teach and so forth. So we're in a, like a little open area, and most of the kids that are there normally don't, they don't have closets because normally most of them only have one or two shirts if they have that. Kids normally below the age of about six down normally don't wear pants. It's a, it's a warm climate. They don't have shorts. That, they just don't have the stuff. Most of the kids, unless I see a Tom shoe now and then or a, an old croc, they don't have any shoes. So imagine all the little boys come up, the little girls come up, and they're about five to six years down, and they have no pants on, just a T-shirt hangs down. So... They know, and the Haitian people are a, a touchy people. They're loving people. They are phenomenal people if you like touchy people. This is what they are there. And they're kind, and, and you, around them it is, it, it is a joy for most people. When I go down there, um, they want to come and sit on your lap. So I was there, this was probably three years ago, four years ago now. And there was a 20-year-old gal that I was watching, and she had like uh, pants that went down to here, like knickers that went down to there, and they're white. And she goes to sit down, and a, and a little boy runs up, and he sits on her lap. He's a little five-year-old boy, it looked like. He sits on her lap. You know the first thing I think? Oh, no, skid marks. <laughs> yeah. That's my compassion meter, all right? I'm not thinking I'm going to hug this little guy. I'm not going to wipe his little nose. I'm thinking, oh, man, when he gets up, it ain't going to be pretty, all right? <laughs> now, I'm just trying to be honest with you. And if you're a guest right now, I understand why you probably never want to come to this church again. <laughs> I do. There's other people, like you saw, they have the, the, the mercy gift, the compassion gift, and, and we try and keep that in their hands. But you ever had a person that, like me that, that says stuff like this? Just suck it up. I mean, you've told them something, they say, just suck it up. Or get it done. Well, you know, here's what's up. Get it, just get it done. 
or they made this statement. You made your bed. You ever, ever said that? You made your bed. And you, so where's, where's the compassion? You know, you made your bed. Or how about this one? Well, what did you expect would happen? So they tell me, what do you expect would happen? My sister um, had a breakup in high school with the guy that she'd been dating for quite a while. And it was like 1230 at night. And she comes and knocks on the door and is crying. And uh, uh, I'm kind of, a, kind of proud that she went to her, her older brother to share her heartbreak. And uh, she's telling me all about it. She'd been going out with this guy for a few years. And uh, she's really busted about it. And she, I listened to her. Uh, it's 12.30 at night. I was really tired. So I listened to her for about a half hour. And then she said, well, what, what, what do you think uh, I should do? And I said, there's more fish in the sea. <laughs> Not that funny, is it? That's a true statement. That's what I said. She's never come to me since with any problems like that ever. <laughs> That was never me. All right. That's, that, now, that's me. Now, can you imagine if the world was a bunch of, of me's? I mean, that kind of a, you know, that didn't even, you didn't, you know, I, I know I, I, know I got to work on it. I mean, and I do. But can you imagine if the world was, was kind of like that? Whereas the compassion, a compassionless world, wouldn't that be a bit tough? With no mercy, no mercy shown? See, I can be just. It's easy for me to be just. That means based on your behavior of what is morally right or fair. I can be just. I can base what I should say to you based on what I think is morally right or fair. But it's harder for me to be merciful. It's harder, harder for me to be merciful. Can you hear this fully? God is both just and completely merciful. God is perfectly just and powerfully merciful and compassionate. In other words, he understands mercy. He understands it. And it's so huge, so huge to this word called hallelujah. It's so huge that you understand this. Here's the text that we're going to kind of park on for the next 15 or so minutes. But I've got to set it up for you. This is written right around the year uh, 580 B.C., roughly uh, 2,600 years ago. We don't know who wrote it, but he was in the midst of, of uh, terrible lament terrible uh, distress. The nation Israel was being uh, judged over and over again for their sin, the way they'd lived. God was being just with them, but trying to show them mercy. And they constantly shunned it away. They, they kept doing their same thing. So uh, this prophet's trying to tell the people, look, here's what's going on. But he's lamenting. He's, he's crying about what's going on. So for about uh, 20 or so chapters, you hear this over and over again. It's a book called Lamentations. You can read it out of the 66 letters that make up the Bible, you can read it, a very raw thing. Most of it is, is totally uh, complaining or, oh God, woe God, this type of thing. But here in the heart of it, the writer makes a realization that is true, that gives hope that is real, that, that has made a difference in my life for the last 15 or 20 years that I can't put into value. This is what uh, my life would be marked mostly by joy, and it's not because of circumstances. It's because sometimes of learnings about that God runs to my mess and this one. And you can have this too. And if you're not a Christian, this is one of the reasons that you should come to know Jesus more because maybe you've misjudged Christianity by looking at some Christians when you've missed actually judging the real thing, and that's Jesus. So here's what the Lumina writes. Right in the middle of all this stuff, he write, gets this thought, and it's just like plugged in like a little gem. And I think it's for us today. Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. Because of the Lord's great love, he's talking about the nation of Israel, we're not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, I say to myself. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Let me read that to you. That word compassions can also be translated mercies. That's the way that most scriptures would translate it. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his mercies... Helping us when we can't help ourselves. His mercies, only he can do this. His mercies, when we're in distress, they're new every morning. When are they new? When? Every morning. The writer says they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness, talking about God. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. His mercies are new every day. His way to help you is new every single day day. There's a 90-year-old hymn that 
some of you grew up singing. And it's called Great is Thy Faithfulness. Written roughly 90 years ago in the year 1925. The guy that wrote it was going through some major problems. But here's what he wrote, and you can kind of read it along to me if you know it. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. That was written, and that's true. Morning by morning new mercies I see. He took that verse in Lamentations, and he wrote a song to it. And for the really the past 75 years to 90 years, we've been singing it in churches all throughout the nation. God is perfectly just and powerfully merciful and compassionate. His mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. Here's two reasons why you have to zone in now. If you've zoned out, lock back in right now, because I'm convinced this is why God has you here, is to hear one of these two. If you're watching online, to watch it there. If you're out in the foyer. There used to be a term in church, probably, I haven't probably heard it for 15 years or so, but the term used to be called backsliding. Any you guys... Remember hearing that term? Somebody's backslidden, they backsliding. And what that implies is, is, well, I knew God at once, and I followed him at once, but now I've kind of gone a way that, you know, either I used to or God wouldn't want me to go, and I'm, I've kind of backslidden, I've backslidden away, and it's been a season of backsliding. I've been backslidden for a year or three months, and, and they come in and they kind of share the story. In fact, some people that have backslidden, I remember they used to come and say, do I need to get rebaptized, or do I need to do any of this confessing again and all this other stuff? And what I've what I realized early on was, was this, was it's, it's uh, backsliding isn't a season. For me, maybe not for you, but for me, backsliding is a daily event. It's a daily event. In other words, I know the standard of God and what he wants, and I even know from a behavior point of view, oftentimes where I need to improve or I need to change. I know things I got to say. And I know that... Uh, I backslide, not for a season, but for a life of days. It's my way. And I think I've seen it for a lot of you. I, I wrote some of this stuff down. Selfishness. I still struggle with it. And I guess I always will, and that's part of the American culture. Maybe some of you are totally generous. And I give, but sometimes I don't give joyfully. Sometimes I give because I know I should. Uh, $39.95, that's all we had to give. I was glad that it wasn't $49.95 or $59.95. There's times where I say to myself, gosh, you're selfish except when it comes to yourself. I backslide a little bit. Or I, I want to control things. God, I, I want your way as long as it's kind of my way. I'm surrendered to you, but could you surrender to me a little bit? I, I kind of fight that. Selfishness, again, it's there all the time. Sometimes I'm unkind and mean-spirited. Sometimes it comes when I'm tired or when I expected somebody to do something. They didn't even know about it. Uh, this past week, yesterday, in fact, I said something to my wife I should have never said. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't divorce-wise, but it was totally rude. The person that I've been with since I'm 14, I should have never said it, and I felt bad about it. And uh, A few minutes later, I went up and apologized. I said it in a time of, of anger, not getting my way. I can just, you can almost feel God when he said, come on, Tom, come on. And you just feel it, and I'm glad that God prompts it to come back. I'm glad that I believe I have a wife that's gracious enough to give me grace when I say something like that or do something like that, to keep no record of it as best she can. Well, there's times I'm led by anger where I just, I, I'm, I'm coming out fighting, and nobody's looking for a fight. I'm just coming out that way, and anger leads the way. And I know God says there's an anger that's destructive. There's a holy anger that's good, but most of it is bad. Quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because the anger of man does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Something, something in the Bible. I don't know the address. There's times where I say hurtful words. There's times where I'm lustful. There's times where I lie. And there's times where I'm greedy. You know what I love? That when I backslide, the next morning, I have a God who says his mercies are new every what? Morning. I don't have to come back three months. I don't have to get rebaptized. I don't have to confess Christ again. I just got to step back up and say, God, give me your mercies. Help me. I'm one in need of help. Help me. Your mercies are new every morning. And if you're a Pentecostal, 
And if you're charismatic, and I told you his mercies are new every morning, you should be saying something right now. His mercies are new every morning. Do you understand for some of you that struggle with sin, his mercies are new every single morning. A little bit more where the apartments could hear you. His mercies are new every morning. That is joyful. My God doesn't condemn me. He doesn't encourage me in that way. He loves me enough to rebuke me or to encourage me or give me hope. And he does that for you. I learned 20 years ago that I was not Jesus Jr. That my morality wasn't floating right near the clouds. I realized I had the same capacity or propensity to sin as other people. Now I realized I had a God and a spirit that was going to convict me more and encourage me more. I grew up with the benefit of a moral family that followed Judeo-Christian principles. So it came a bit more naturally. But backsliding? I wish I could tell you I don't backslide. I backslide every day of my life. And yet there's a God, hallelujah, who says, let's start today, a new day. Let's make this one better. Let's take that relationship and let's mend it. Let's give truth and power to your words, not hurt and pain. Let's give you a church that can help guide you and a word that can enlighten your path. Hallelujah, his mercies are new every day. And if you've lived a life that you said, I wouldn't want my children to ever live, then hallelujah, today his mercies can be new. This is not God speak. This is not to pump you up. This is the truth. The lamenter knew the sin that was breaking down an entire community and culture. And he said his mercies are new every day and they're sufficient. That's something to be joyful about. That's something to wake up every morning with and understand it. Amen? Hallelujah? Hallelujah. His mercies are new every morning. Well, it's just not about people that backslide. It's just not about people that don't get it right all the time. His mercies are new every morning for some of you who are in overwhelming circumstances. I've been praying really a lot about this holiday season. See, for a lot of people like me, I hesitated showing those pictures, start a service. Because for a lot of you, this is the painful time of the year. You've been in a season of loss or hurt or it reminds you of something you don't have. And I understand that. At times, this season can be overwhelming. And depending on where you're at right now, you understand what I'm saying. God doesn't just say his mercies are new because of our behavior. His mercies are new because he's bigger than our circumstances. I thought about a group of people that I've been praying about for the past couple weeks during this service. Some of you that are alone, that you feel just total lonely. His mercies are new every morning for you. And I know loneliness can be painful. And I know your families may not be together. You may not have one or they've passed. His mercies are new every morning. His promise is true. I don't know how he does it, whether he brings a phone call, whether he gives you more strength, more hope, more courage. But his mercies are are new every morning when we cry out to him. And he can see you through this season as he's done for millions of people that have called out his name. He can see you through it. I know some of you are in financial stress where you feel like an ax is just ready to cut you off. God's mercies are new. I don't know how he works it. I don't know what he does, but his mercies are new. And you can get through this. And there are some circumstances in life that are overwhelming by yourself. But with God, he has no level of difficulty. He does not. He can control so many different resources that can help, and you need to lean into that. And then for many of you, uh, for you new moms, I've been uh, kind of awakened to the idea of, again, I've kind of forgot what it was like to have little babies around the house. For some of you that are new, that's overwhelming. Overwhelming. You're on call 24-7, 365. And what hangs in the balance is, if you don't help them, they're not going to survive. And at times you can think, what have I gotten myself into? And then some of you have two and three and four kids. For you, you have a mental health problem. No, I'm just... <laughs> For you, it can be overwhelming. Look at me, moms. If you're online, listen to me. God wants you to cry out to his mercies every day. Keeping up with all those kids, you don't have the energy or probably even the wisdom 
you call out to God, and he provides both. And I don't know how he sets it up, but he does. His mercies are new every morning. And some of you that are in tough family situations, maybe you're by yourself. His mercies are new. He's not forgotten you. Some of you, family splintered, and you wish you could have a do-over. You wish you could go back over. His mercies are new every morning. You never know what he'll do or how he'll pull you through. I thought I had a friend that was here at church, an amazing friend. She has three children of her own, and she has a, a, a mercy gift off the charts from God. It's just who she is. She can't, she can't not be merciful. And she had the call within the past year to to foster children. Now, it would be just like Christians under the guidance of Jesus and the Spirit guiding you to become foster people. But that is a tough call. It's hard. If you fall in love with a child, you risk the chance that that child leaves, and then your heart's ripped. If you fall in love with a child, and the child's pulled back to another situation, you know it's hard, your heart's ripped. If the children that you have come in with major, major issues, then you know how hard that is. And on one hand, you're, you're, you know you're called to foster. On the other hand, you're thinking, why am I ever doing this? This is so hard. This My friend found herself with two little foster kids. And this holiday season hasn't been the same for her own three kids because it's been so disruptive. And she's torn between hurting my family, and yet I know these children need love. And what I've, what I've been praying for her is his mercies are new for you every morning. He can help you in this time of, 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 of sorrow and joy, correctness and hardship. And I don't know who of you is watching this, but I got to believe God's saying the same thing to you. I am with you. My mercies are new every single morning, every single morning of your life. That person that's struggling through that, the teen that's struggling through their teen years, that their family's just not what you want it to be, or either you're not where you're supposed to be in school, or there's pressures going on, or you've got a friend group that's either harassing you, hurting you, or helping you in the wrong area. I've been praying for you. His mercies are new every morning. If you feel overwhelmed by his school load, his mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. I'm not saying he'll take it away, but he gives you the strength to persevere through it. For those of you that are struggling with drugs or alcohol or porn or lust, or you pick whatever you want to pick. He's a God of mercy. And it may not click on overnight. If it does, praise God. But if it doesn't, his mercies are new every morning. He can help you. He is the one to go to. For those of you that are facing the home stretch of life, I don't even have to define that. You know it's the the, the, the the ninth inning. You know the body doesn't feel the same. His mercies are as new for you at 85 as it is for the 15-year-old or the six-month-old. His mercies are new every morning for you. He can make you better at 85 than you ever were at 25. His mercies are new every morning. Psalm 27. I love this. Written over 3,000 years ago. Psalmist writes, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. And you should go Pentecostal on that right now. Hallelujah. He said, some trust in situations. Some trust, I trust in God. I trust in his mercy. It's not going to be the car. It's not going to be the house. It's not going to be the job that's going to pull me through. Those are fine and those are to be grateful for. But it's his mercy that pulls us through because all of us backslide at a time over two. All of us find ourselves in a situation that's of distrust, that's of hardship, that we're not bigger than. And his mercies are new. His mercies are powerful every single morning. And God's people said, hallelujah. Revelation 19.1, the very last book of Scripture. Out of all the 66 letters that comprise the Bible, this one. I wondered, is the word hallelujah ever mentioned? Is it mentioned in the last book? I know it's mentioned in Psalms and various. We read in Revelation 19.1. After this. I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting. Read it with me. Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. So I said, heaven, I heard it. I heard everybody saying hallelujah. Why were they praising God? Why was a group of people singing to God a chorus so loud I couldn't put numbers on it? Why? 
He entered our mess. His mercies were new every morning. He sustained us when we thought that somebody else was carrying us. He was giving us breath there to breathe. He was giving us eyes to see, ears to hear. He was giving us hope that the world can't offer, a peace that, will, that normal life will rob you of. He was giving you a base to build off of, a life that has minimal regrets. And yet if you have regrets, God forgives them. Hallelujah. That's what they shouted. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. This morning, I would I, I'd rather be no, no other place with you, except that there's one other place I would, kind of would like to have been this morning. It's called Oak Bridge City. And all I could say was, was hallelujah, God. Another group of people are going to hear about this Jesus, this God who didn't come to condemn you, even though the world wants to think that and say that. It's just not true. He came to save you and set you free, to give you a hope and a purpose and a peace, to give you a wisdom that maybe you didn't grow up with, to give you a wisdom that goes beyond human teaching, to tell you that he's, he's no respecter of people. He loves all people, all genders. No matter whether you have a, an untatted body or a body that's tatted up one side to the other, God loves you and desires your heart and wants to give you hope. So today at Oak Bridge City, they have a backdrop that's just like this. Their backdrop looks exactly the same. It says, hallelujah. But behind their backdrop is a concrete uh, wall that has these words engraved in it in gold leaf. And it says this, do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. That's Micah 6, 8. That's one of the books of the Bible. Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. That's behind their hallelujah. And I thought, what a great thing. Do justice. Help people that need help. Be just. Help the oppressed, the lonely, the hurting. Do something that's just worthy, that's, that's, that's worthy of justice and kindness. Love mercy. You can help some people. God wants to help you. He loves mercy. And when you learn to love mercy, you won't think of yourself better than other people. You'll learn to walk humbly with your Lord. That is amazing. That is amazing. One more time. Just stand on the count of three. Just say hallelujah. One, two, three. Hallelujah. 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 Father, we come to you. And we thank you. Thank you for who you are and what you've done. We thank you that you run to our messes. That when we turn to you, you're there. We thank you, dear God, that the mercy, your ability to help us when we can't help ourselves, your ability to show kindness and compassion, goes beyond our human understanding. When we think we don't deserve it, it's true, but yet you give it to us. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for next week and what you'll continue to do in our hearts and the hearts of so many in the world as your son's revealed more clearly. Father, I pray that this last song that we sing is an anthem to you. I pray that today you've touched hearts and the, the hearts that have been touched know it's been you, that they needed to be here today. They needed to hear this. They needed to watch this. They needed to feel this. God, I thank you for your spirit that moves in us. It's in your son's name that I pray. And all God's people said. For the next seven days, I'm going to challenge you. And here's what I want to challenge you with. There's a little statement that I want you to say. And it's called, New Mercies Today. This is your way. New Mercies Today. This is your way. I want you to wake up for the next seven days starting tomorrow. And I want you to say, God, I don't know what, I'm, what you're going through. I don't know what you've been struggling with sin-wise. I don't know where you've been. But God, new mercies today. This is your way. Ingrain that in your mind. You'll find a power to persevere, to get through, to overcome that. I don't think you found before because his mercies are new. Amen. He entered our mess. He gives us mercy each morning new. Let's sing this song to the one who's here with us today. And we lean on to stand up, please, if you will.
Okay, I need you to do something real quick. Just somebody around you, they can be a friend, a neighbor, you may not even know them. Just look at them and just say, say this. Hallelujah, our God shows mercy every day. Say that to somebody. Challenge for you. Just remind that, start to get that in there. You'll find a deeper strength than you can imagine. God says in John 10.10, 10, he, he sent Jesus to give us life abundantly, fully, more than the, any other place can offer. And he does it in ways that are just like this. We have that joyful praise of God. I'm going to encourage some of you right now. We have some gaps for volunteers. We have 150 great people that have gone to plant another church under their calling. You could go to the connect room right behind here. You could say, look, sign me up for something. And I promise you, God will bless you. There's nothing like serving. Some of you need to invite some people. You need to make an invite. You need to think who God's put on your mind. Any of you today, while you're sitting here, you thought, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this. Anybody? You're the person. You're the person. I can't invite them. I don't know them. You're the person. Make the invite. The only thing I can tell you is what? No. Make the invite. Bring them. Tell them you pay for Texas Roadhouse afterwards. It makes it harder for them to say no. <laughs> I want you to do that. Then one last little thing for you. Uh, next week, the 23rd, some of you have asked, we have Tom's shoes that will be for sale back in the bookstore. It's where you buy one and a third world person gets that. If you want to do that, if you're looking for a gift, they'll be back there. You guys can see them, and that would be great. And with that said, I want to tell you just a little about message series and what they've meant to me. This past week in the car, and we're almost done, just one minute. This past week in the car, I was listening to some messages that I'd kept from 1990. So they're 28-year-old messages. The weird thing was that they're on cassette, and my car has a cassette player. All right? So I was playing them on cassette. I can tell you one thing. I can, cassettes are a bear to rewind and find your place. They're ridiculous. If you never went through that, they're terrible. But I, the message still spoke to my heart. 20 years, I know I've heard these before. I've just pulled out some stuff. Some of these CDs that are back there, there's some people you'll never get here. You'll never, they're just not going to come for whatever reason, but you give them a CD, you may be shocked in the privacy of their car, or they're not, where pride doesn't enter the picture, or they're not hearing I told you so. They may listen to something that God wants them to hear in that moment for like 10 or 12 bucks, and this is not a plea for money. We don't make anything off these, trust me. Go back there and buy one if God has you a series. I don't know what series to do. Can I just say from all my heart again, I am so proud of all you, of what you've done for your families, for your community, for yourself with Jesus, how you've honored God. Next week, part three of Hallelujah. Please tell me why. See you then. Thanks for coming.